Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest, guest is Nate and Bethany Smith. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Thank, Thank you, you for, having, for us. having us. Excited. Yeah, it's neat to have you both on the show. I know we've met at a, in a mastermind, like I said, uh, probably a year or so ago, something like that. And uh, just uh, exciting to have you you all now on the, on the podcast and, and us learn a little more about behind the scenes, how you all have made this happen and where you're at now. Uh, but a little about them. They house hacked their first home 11 years ago with a VA loan. Congratulations about that. I wish I had known about the VA loan when, you know, like just buying our first property years ago, my wife and I, house hacking. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that would have been a great route. But Nate has served 13 years in the United States Air Force and is currently a C-130J pilot in the California Air National Guard with a commercial aviation background. Thank you for your service, Nate. Uh, Bethany has a background in residential real estate sales and transitioned into multifamily investing full-time in early 2019. She is also acting asset manager on several communities in Nevada and Arizona, most recently closing on a 36-unit C-class property. Congratulations. And together, they are building a world financial groups, uh, financial services agency in Southern California and nationwide, helping their team and clients save, grow, and protect their wealth. So I think it's neat, guys, just, you know, how you all are working together and you got these, uh, you, know, you, you all are experienced in real estate and you're growing that business. And then also just your experience with the this other business you're, you're, you're putting together and helping people being able to build wealth uh, at the same time. And, and it, cause it's, it's not, it's not something that just happens overnight. Uh, no. Is it? Uh, so, you know, but give us a look, tell the listeners a little more about who you all are and, and your focus and let's jump in. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll give a little bit about background on me. Um, grew up in Boise, Idaho. Nate and I got married uh, about 11 years ago. And uh, as, as Whitney mentioned earlier, we uh, house hacked our, our first home and f- saw a lot of value in, in um, well, basically we had, to, uh, we had to PCS, which means permanent change of station, military talk. And uh, we were forced to rent that home out basically. And we, none of us knew, neither of us knew anything about real estate investing, but it kind of got our toe in the water and interested in it. And we're like, wow, we can cash flow. We were cash flowing about $150 a month. So we thought we were big time and uh, found a decent property manager. Uh, we owned that home for about eight years. Um, and uh, through career pursuits and whatnot, we, we, took, we, we put the investing on a back burner for several years. Um, we, we did a uh, little bit of training and education here and there. We um, uh, learned a lot from uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki's program. Um, but really the interest in real estate investing didn't pop up again, um, about for about six years later, I'd say, um, I was really interested in getting into real estate investing. Um, but I didn't really know how, how, you know, how to get in that space. I thought, I thought at first maybe I want to be a realtor and just learn more about contracts and that sort of thing. So, um, I worked for a real estate, uh, residential sales team in Utah. We're actually one of the top teams, um, in Utah. Um, awesome group of ladies. I was the director of operations and all female team and, uh, about 25% of our investor or our clients were investors. They were buying duplexes, fourplexes, that sort of thing. And I really gravitated towards uh, working with those clients. I loved just how they thought and, um, you know, everything was based on numbers. They were very non-emotional about their purchases and I could see, you know, they're making decent money. And so wanted to get more into the commercial space really. And that led us to um, trying to learn, educate ourselves. Um, At the time we were moving around a lot. Nate was in uh, military flight training, um, but really wanted to kind of get into the um, apartment and multifamily industry a little bit more. And so um, about a year ago, December, December, 2018, I decided to completely cut ties or quit, quit that job that I was in and jump both feet into multifamily apartment investing. I don't recommend that. I'm not saying you should do that. Uh, For me, it was, it was the right thing to do at that time. 
And so I kind of needed to make that clean break and just go full bore into it. It was what I knew I wanted to do. And so I'm glad I did that, but spent really all of 2019 learning, educating myself, trying to get in those circles and networks of people that were doing investing. And um, so that was a really, it was a really fun year last year. I learned so much. And then we found our first deal in August about, um, was that eight months after really started, you know, getting into it full time. And then we closed on it in December. Nice. Jumped in 2018. You said you wouldn't recommend just jumping in like that. But, but tell me, you know, a couple of things. Or did, you, did you do that just to burn the bridge and say, okay, you know, we're going to make this happen. I'm, I'm moving forward with this. And then there, there's no way I can go back. Yeah, for me, um, my, my the line of work that I was doing, it was very, very stressful, very, very time consuming. And I, I it, it was hard for me to be able to balance it with something else because it was kind of invading all other parts of the day. And it was just hard to like, okay, I'm not going to focus on or I'm going to clock out from that job and focus on this stuff as I essentially was on call for a lot of things. Um, just little fires that pop up throughout the day for, for real estate. We were closing about 120 deals a year and only really a handful of agents, um, if not one or two at a time. So it was just busy. So I needed to kind of make that, that clean break. I think that was the biggest reason for it. Yeah. I think that helps us sometimes to just be committed. Right. And then there's no, mm -hmm. I mean, I had to do something very similar uh, and make a big decision to say, okay, you know, we're just moving forward this way. And I think that was helpful for me mentally just, yeah. just to know there's no turning back. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it was very much, I was fortunate to do, to do that because Nate was, um, you know, working full time and able to be the primary breadwinner or the only breadwinner. Um, but yeah, it definitely helped me mentally to just burn the ships. Okay. I've decided I've committed this. It's, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this first deal. I think that's a nice uh, dynamic too, when somebody's going to get into, and, and please speak to this, uh, a nice dynamic for a couple when one can be the breadwinner, if you are going to start a new venture, like the other one can devote all their time to it because there's no income from it. Right. But, you, right. but you're not just, you know, you're not just jumping in with no income saying, Oh, you know, I've got a couple thousand dollars in the bank. I'll be okay. <laughs> you know? Right. Cause that would, so. I can't imagine how just incredibly stressful that would be. And it would probably make you make more unwise decisions, you yes. know, and perhaps offer on something you really shouldn't because you're just so yeah. eager to get that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing that I, the other thing too is, um, I was the, I was working full time at the time. I was still active duty in the military, going through just finishing up pilot training. Um, but one thing that, one other thing that we, we had in that, that period of time while I was going through pilot training, we got introduced to uh, another type of real estate, um, called military crash pads, which is basically like, for lack of a better word, Airbnb, it's that type of style. Basically you can rent out the house by the room. And we house hacked that one too. Yeah. House hacked that, <laughs> that one too. Cause we, uh, we had used it. We used another VLO. So what happened was we were living in one in San Antonio and we got familiar with the model and we saw what the, the income, the thing was producing. We did the math real quick and uh, it's it pretty lucrative. And so I talked to the owner of the company or who the guy who was facilitating the, the whole thing. And I was like, Hey, we're going to pilot training in the Arkansas. Do you guys need a house there? I'm like, yep, we need a new one. We only have one there right now. We're looking at another one. So we, we just drove out there. We did one, we did two days of looking at houses and it was <laughs> yeah. As an investor, you don't care if you like the house. You just care, is it nice? Does it, yeah. does it meet the parameters of what they're looking for? So um, went out there, found the property, bought it. He was able to use a VA loan again. Um, and, you know, just had to pay for the furnishing. It wasn't too bad. And then we, um, we had people in, the, in it within a couple of weeks of us launching it. So Which kind of, it was kind of a funny yet stressful period to get the house set up because we thought we were going to have tenants in it within, let's see, we, we closed, closed on Friday, closed on a Friday and we went out Saturday and Sunday and spent 20 grand to buy furnishings and everything. Yeah. We were supposed <laughs> to have a guest. We were supposed to have our first, uh, our first, uh, guest, if you will, on, on, on Monday. Monday so. Yeah. Oh, we wow. Like there is, there's the potential for that. So we wanted to be ready. It ended up working out. It ended up being, we ended up having another week, but it was fun anyways, but it forced us to get it done and it was done. And it's been a cash flow. It's been a nice cash flowing asset for us and something that's been very hands off because, uh, you know, the nice thing about being a military crash pad is the tenants are, are responsible. It's, um, all guys going through pilot training, people that I know and stuff like that. So it works out really well, but that's definitely been a huge help to allow her because that didn't quite replace her income, but it almost it replaced about 50% of what she was making before. And so that really was a huge help to have that aspect to it as well. So I mean, to, to, 
she didn't like completely lose out on like the income wasn't like completely gone. So I don't want to just caveat that there. But uh Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I would so say that's helps. a pretty successful venture there if it would replace fifty percent of your of your income. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very niche product. Yeah. Um it's like only a handful of places in the country that it will work because it has to be close to a military base, not just any military base, it has to be close to a military base that has a high level of temporary duty traffic called TDY traffic. People are just going there for a short period of time for some training and then they're moving on because um, otherwise if they're there for any much longer than six months, it's going to call a permanent change of station. So they're permanently being there. They're not going to go rent out, rent out by the room for you know, a period of time. So. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so, so the, then was, you, you all moved from, from those to, or Bethany, you wanted to move into multifamily or maybe both of you, uh, you know, into larger multifamily and uh, give me a couple of things that, that you learned along the way that helped you to get to the larger deal. Um, I would say the power of relationship and the power of mm -hmm. n not only networking, but really trying to niche down into yeah. groups of people that are doing what you want to do and um, see how you can offer value to them and get around them as much as possible. I mean, a couple of things I did last year to really learn is go on a mastermind to Los Cabos with a bunch of people that were active investors. And you know, it was a little bit of money and it, traveling internationally, Nate was deployed at the time. So, and I hadn't met, I'd only met a couple of these people in person before, but people were like, you're going to Mexico with a bunch of people that you met on Facebook? That's... <laughs> <laughs> your husband's gone is that safe but it was so much fun just spending time with them hearing you know hearing about all the processes and the things they went through so I was so glad I did that I made a trip out to Dallas to shadow a general contractor for a friend that has um, several thousand units just to see how their unit turns went and it just helps so much to get your feet on the ground and see the work in action it's one thing to read about it but to actually see it in action and be like okay that makes sense you wouldn't put you wouldn't put stainless steel appliances in this type of unit, you know, you wouldn't do that kind of upgrade. So it really helps to see it in person, but yeah, the, the power of the relationship um, for me, basically back up a little bit. So in December, 2018, when I was considering um, quitting my job, Nate was a big instigator of that. He had um, been following a couple people in the multifamily space and was encouraging me to read some books and learn more about it. Like, Hey, you like commercial real estate. You like multifamily apartments. You should read these books. And, um, through those connections, he, he got on a Facebook group and, um, long story short, that's how I met my business partner. It was his group. He was talking about how he buys apartments and, um, and now we're, now we're working together, but it was very purposeful interaction and kind of strategic to get to know him and other people in the group and um, just showing my face being someone that they could know like and trust and um, seeing how I could offer value to them so yeah you mentioned uh, you mentioned niching down with other groups of people I, I couldn't agree more with it just the relationships are so important I mean in any business but I know in this business it, it's just crucial uh, mm -hmm. but you know how you, you mentioned niching down in other groups what, what does that mean uh, niching down in, oh, um, well, I mean, basically for, uh, finding those who are moving things and shaking things like find, finding who's really doing the work yeah. and spending time with them and not, you know, offering to take them out to lunch or offering to fly out to them. Hey, if you'll, if you'd be so good as to let me just follow you around and listen to you talk on the phone and walk your property, that would be amazing. You know? Um, and, and so, and just trying that, that showed you're pretty serious right there. If you're willing to yeah. just fly out, right? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And for, for me and my business partner, how we, how we basically started working together is got to know each other a little bit first on Facebook and then met in person and still liked each other pretty well. And, um, we're looking in similar markets. And so we're like, Hey, if we're looking in the same thing and he had, he had, um, he needed to find, he wanted to find additional assets, but didn't really have the time or the energy, you know, to really just fly out and look at something at the drop of a hat or um, go out to those markets once a month to check on his property. So he kind of needed someone to be boots on the ground. And I had a lot of time, obviously I wasn't working and, um, and I had the time to find a deal. So, um, so it's kind of a great match, you know. You tell me about how that partnership got you to that deal, your first, you know, larger multifamily deal. Uh, so uh, yeah, the part partnership was just crucial. Um, 
you know, getting clear on the criteria, what we're both looking for and making sure we're in agreement about that. Um, we've had other people, you know, to, that we attempt working with for a bit that they want to go after an A-class product, um, a really nice, you know, luxury type uh, apartments. And what, what we have is a C-class, very workforce housing, a lot of subsidy tenants. Um, for lack of a better term, it can be a little, a little grubby, you know? And so if you're not looking for the same type of thing, it's not going to work out. So we got really clear on the, on the criteria, agreed on parts of town that we wanted to stay out of, you know, bad parts of town, um, and parts of town that were really easily accessible, you know, high traffic areas, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so communicate about those clearly and communicate often. We were often in contact and that kind of helped me, you know, want to, be able not really to have a report, but just to have stuff going, you know, stuff in the pipeline. So, um, and, and he was just really, it's crucial to have someone, you know, that's in your corner and kind of your cheerleader, like, okay, you know, that one didn't work out, ran the numbers. That's why, you know, we run the numbers so carefully and, and didn't work out and that's good, you know, and, and okay, that, that person said no, or the seller said no, you know, just keep going. So um, it's great to have that, that kind of uh, supportive partnership as well. So something you all have, I think is very interesting is that, you know, you have, you know, you're focused on the real estate business, but then you also have this other arm that's uh, the, the world financial group, you know, just financial services. And uh, tell me about that connection or the relationship or how, how that works. Yeah. So we got introduced to the business um, late last year and got partnered up with the gentleman that I've been following for a long time, considered a mentor. His name's Ed Milet. And um, really I fell in love with the business aspect of it and how they really help families when it comes to all things to do with, with finances, uh, full service financial services company. And I saw my initial t pull to it was I was, um, you know, working with investors and I, I know, you know, I'd see people who have maybe tied, money tied up somewhere else, like an old 401k or old IRA. And they're trying to figure out, and it, maybe they, or maybe they're just wanting to figure out how can they get a financial plan together to invest in real estate someday. Maybe they want to invest in a, an apartment deal, but they don't have the cash to do it yet. Uh, but they're a W-2 warrior and that's what they're going to, and they're not, they love their job. They love their career, but like, how can I start show, you know, maybe transitioning into some investing, maybe it's just part, whatever that, whatever their situation is, they offered the solution to help people get that plan together. And so um, I was really excited about that. In addition to the partnership that we have with, with uh, someone I've considered a mentor for a long time. And so just, yeah, very excited about it. We're growing like crazy, uh, expanding all over the country. It's very exciting. What, what's your, what's your typical client? Like who is your, your avatar for, for that side of your all's business? Yeah. So I, I, there's two avatars that I really focus in on. Uh, the first one is the person that has an old 401k, old IRA. They're in, they're, maybe they're getting close to retirement and they don't like the, what's going on in the market. They want to see how they can protect their money and so they, they're not losing. I've helped multiple clients recently do that. Um, the other one is the, anybody who's looking for a vehicle that they can grow, grow and protect their wealth and do it in a way that is tax, tax advantage. So I specialize in helping people get tax advantage options in their portfolio, uh, things that the wealthy get access to. Uh, basically it's cash value life insurance allows you to grow your money tax-free, access it anytime, well not anytime, but after a period of time you get to access it 100%, utilize it for other investments. You can grow money two different places, basically call it uh, different terms. Infinite banking is probably the most common one that's used and how that's leveraged. And, most of my clients, most of the people I talk to are in the real estate space. So that's the angle that I'm, I'm talking to them about. It gives up good asset protection, wealth, wealth protection, gives you good, I know if you're looking for how to, how to pass on money to the next generation, it's a great way to do it because it passes on you know, completely tax-free as well. So, um, but yeah, those are the two big clients. Is anybody who's, who's worried about how their money's doing in the market, they want to have, have a way to protect it with a zero floor and still be able to get some upside, I can help them in both, both areas. So it's the older folks looking to retire, and the younger folks not wanted to repeat what their parents did. <laughs> so ultimately, I mean, we could use that money for this infinite banking method like you're talking about, but also use it for investing in real estate. Absolutely. And that's, that's the primary way we're using it is we're growing the money in the policy right now. And then once we have it reach a certain amount, probably 50, a hundred thousand, I'll be able to pull out probably depending on how long between now, long now until that time is, but between 70 and a hundred percent of that accumulated value I can pull out in a, tax-free loan that I can then deploy into another real, another asset. Uh, and I can grow money in two places because it's a loan against the policy. I'm not actually pulling my cash out. So I'm still earning whatever my interest rate is in, in that account. And I'm, and I'm also earning over in the, the real estate asset. Um, 
And people use it for all kinds of things. Anything you can think of, there's no restriction on how you can use that money when you pull it. How does it pay us now? Or, or is it just life insurance? Uh, so, so you have the life insurance side. So there's basically two buckets on it. You have one side, your death benefit, you have a cost of insurance. That, that is that part. But then you have the cash value side and that's the tax advantage vehicle that allows you to, the government allows you to grow a certain amount of money inside of that tax free. And that amount is determined based on the size of the policy. So just as a general example, a million dollar policy is around $30,000 is what you can grow tax free inside of that. So you're going to beat the Roths and you're going to beat the 401ks as far as contribution. And then but the big benefit is the ability to access it, to use it for whatever you want in your living years. So, uh, and not have to pay taxes on it. Now, if you pull it out, you use it on a real estate deal, you'll pay taxes on your gains over there most maybe, or something like that. But the growth inside of there is, is completely tax free. So if you really use it as an infinite banking, you, I mean, people use it to pay for college for their kids. Because if your kid doesn't want to go to college, you got a 529, what are you going to do? Um, you kind of, you have to use that money for education here. They can grow there. If they don't use it for education, they can use it for anything. They can use it for helping the kids start a business. Um, some people use it to buy their vehicles, down payment on a house, um, supplement retirement. There's a lot of different ways people can, can utilize it. Really, the only, the only negative to it is you have to be able to qualify for it medically because it is life insurance. So, you know, if you're not, if there's a, something that inhibits you from getting qualified or it's cost prohibitive, then that's, I guess if there's a negative, that's the biggest negative to, to it. It's having to qualify medically. Even, yep. even though it's our money we're putting in, we well, still have to qualify medically. Yeah, because you only get that vehicle through through the life insurance contract. So you don't get that that cash value side without the, the life insurance. So you have to qualify for the life insurance to be able to utilize the, the policy. Okay. But we can put it in there. Ultimately, we can put it in there. We can gain gain interest over there. But then we can take a loan out and go invest in real estate and gain our return over there, hopefully. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's called arbitrage. Banks do it all the time with your money. Why not do it for yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a couple, couple resources to learn more about that too. Um, one is a book called uh, The Better Money Method. Yeah, right? but, yeah, Better Money Method. Better Money really Method. Good. And then the other one is What Would the Rockefellers Do? Um, authors is, the author is Gunderson. I forget what the, I think Laxton is The Better Money Method. Yeah. So those are really good books. Just kind of start exploring those, those realms. Um, you know, The Rockefeller Method is all about how the Rockefellers were able to, because they look at two different families, look at the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. Vanderbilts, while they were very wealthy Americans, they weren't able to keep that generational wealth going where the Rockefellers were. And a big part of their strategy to keep, they're still one of the wealthiest families in, in America, if not the world. It's be, and one of their primary strategies was using cash flow, cash value life insurance to, to accomplish that. So. Interesting. I and mean, we should be all be thinking more long-term like that, right? Yeah. Our children and their children and a generational wealth. Uh, so, you know, just a few, we're about out of time. So a few final questions before we, before we have to go, but tell me a way you all have improved your business, but uh, you know, uh, that we could apply to ours as well. I would say the number one thing right now with everything that's going on with coronavirus is it's forcing us all to go virtual. Um, we were kind of ahead of the game on, on the, the financial services side of the business as far as transitioning to more virtual, but I'm doing all my appointments virtual now. All my business growth is happening virtual. The team is growing across the country. It's all virtual. And then as far as the multifamily stuff, she can probably talk a little bit about that with some of the meetup stuff we've been doing. Yeah, but. well, the, the, um, the biggest thing this last year that helped me and be more, most efficient is to really focus, um, to focus on the one thing. There's a book I read by Gary Keller, I believe, that's called The One Thing. And it's all about um, pinpointing those activities that are going to move your needle forward and give you the most momentum and, and are the, high, the most highly productive activities that you can do. And make sure those are prioritized in your day that you do them when you're at your best working ability, which for me is like between the hours of 8 and 11 in the morning. So I want my most highest attention detail, my highest priority tasks to be done during that time where I'm most focused and energetic and everything. So that book really helped me a lot because it was like, all right, you know, you, do, you just need to prioritize and hunker down and focus on that one thing and make sure it gets done every day. If it's a daily task. Mm. You, you know, that's, that's, I, that's part of my best time, but I'm not so sure it's not just because I, I'm drinking a big thing of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. That, yeah. Whatever, whatever it takes to get that one thing. <laughs> yeah. So tell me with those changes like that, what does it look like, you know, connecting with investors and, and really marketing your own businesses, you know, to investors as well, real estate or financial services, you know, now that you, you can't be out and about, you know, and having those in-person meetings, which I, I love to have or offer to investors, but 
you know, we, we can't do that at the moment. What does that look like for you all? I mean, it's definitely forcing us to get more social on social media. I mean, everybody's on social. If everyone wasn't on social media before, they are all on social media now. Um, that's something that I've, I'm definitely working on and getting better at, but just letting people talk about what you're doing. Um, go do more Facebook lives, do post more on your, on your, on your feed and talk market yourself, talk about what you're doing. That's something that I'm starting to do more of. And, um, cause they're all sitting at home. They're all on their phones. They're on Instagram way more. I'm sure uh, someone posted something funny on Facebook the other day. She goes, she goes, who's getting alerts on their phone that they, you know, significantly increased their screen time. Um, you know, they sell on Apple phones. They'll do that. So, uh, just get on social media. I mean, that's the biggest one market. Let people know what you're doing. Reach out to people. You know, I've seen a lot of people doing these, uh, you know, virtual happy hours. Yeah. Everybody like, well, get it on a Zoom call and do a little happy hour thing just to keep everything social. But, but those things are important too. I think the most important thing I've learned in the businesses that I've done, uh, I had a marketing business before that we did real estate stuff, the financial services, is everywhere we've gone, we've always tried to make an effort to develop that no like, and trust factor. So like she mentioned earlier with the Facebook group is we would go live in that group a lot. And so when we show up to, to events and things like that, people knew who we were. And it helps develop that no like and trust. So same thing with social media. If people see you, they hear you, they will, they get to know you better and they're more likely to want to interact with you. Hopefully they'll like you. Yeah. Hopefully they'll like you. <laughs> that's right. So I ask a lot of people like the, the one thing that's contributed to their success. But I think for, like for you all, I, I'd like to know like as a couple, you know, pursuing businesses like this, especially while being deployed at times too. I mean, you know, it doesn't just happen overnight that, that, you know, a marriage is a success and that, you know, you all have made it work and, and, you know, creating these businesses, successful businesses at the same yes. time. Uh, and, and so, you know, what's the one thing that's re- contributed to your all success together uh, while pursuing, uh, you know, our, our successful businesses at the same time? I think for me, the biggest thing is just always, we've been pretty good about having open communication. Like, and always having the, and always realizing the other person doesn't, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt, understanding that we're not at war with each other. We may have disagreements, you know, and we work through a lot of that. And in the early years is just um, trusting that we, we still love each other. Like at the end of the day, like we still love each other. We still like each other. We're just working through how do we work this together? How do we work these things out together? And so um, that's probably the biggest one. And then for as far as just working together, like I had, I had a certain vision for how, what I wanted, and she had a different vision and then figuring out, you know, what, are, what could clear on what we wanted out of life, but and then figuring out what the, and then getting aligned on the same path to get there. Cause like, uh, you know, for a long time, I big, I've always had these big ambitions of, I've always had a side hustle. I've always had something where I was doing on the side and ultimate goal is getting in the business. The big reason why I went to the Air National Guard versus staying active duty. So I wanted to be able to have a business uh, that I could do uh, full time and, um, and then for, you know, just kind of doing that and, and working, to, you know, figuring out how to work together and communicate, open, open communication and trusting. Yeah, that I would you say the doubt. for sure the same, like gracious honesty is the yeah. best way I could say to put it is because um, we, we've always had quite a bit of stuff going. I would say we've always had like our main jobs and then at yeah. least one or two side hustles too. And so we've worked together a lot and we, we have a lot of things going. So just being very honest and get to the point and bring up an issue sooner than later. So it doesn't sit there and fester and, um, you know, be all passive aggressive and everything, just have it, have it out, but do it graciously. And always like, I expect expecting the, you know, they, that they acted with their best intentions, like Mm -hmm. assume that they did that and don't assume the worst. That's not always easy, is it? No, no, (laughs) simple, not easy. Yeah, it's not. It, you got you got to teach him that you're just always right, right, Bethany? <laughs> no, actually, not always. Come, come to find out. <laughs> no, this has been fun, guys. I've been grateful to have you know grateful for your all's time and just sharing on the show. Tell the listeners uh, how you like to give back. Um, you said give back. Yeah, how do you all like to give back? We have two. Um, so one one uh, nonprofit that we're heavily involved in is called the Commemorative Air Force. Um, it's a it's it's a nonprofit that's nationwide. We have a wing down here in Southern California. They find and restore uh, World War II era aircraft and fly them in air shows and do rides. Um, you can check that out at cafsocal.com. Um, it's an awesome organization, um, and we do that kind of together. Uh, not quite so much now uh, as our time's a little more limited, but I'm the gift shop manager there and Nate's done a lot of uh, marketing help for them. So that's one. 
too. Nice. Well, thank you all for giving back in that way. Thank you again for your, your service to our country, both of you, uh, just as a spouse as well. I know that's not easy, especially when, when the other's deployed. So uh, hard, hard stuff. We've done, I've done it myself. So uh, thank you all again uh, for that. And tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, the best way is going to be on Instagram at the real Nate Smith. Now you can look me up on Facebook as well. Yep. Same Instagram, uh, MF as in multifamily boss lady on Instagram and also on Facebook. Thank you for listening to the real estate syndication show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.